So thank you all again for t for coming. Um, this is going to be uh, this is the third of uh, this webinar series that we uh, have been doing through the North Carolina State University Apiculture Program. Uh, this is uh, a new format where I believe we have upwards of eight different uh, county chapters attending right now. Uh, thank you all for uh, for attending. Um, I see Alamance, Burke, Henderson, Lincoln, Montgomery, uh, Rockingham, Stanley, and Surrey at, at the very least. If I'm missing anybody else there, uh, my apologies. But again, thank you so much for coming. And of course, again, thank you again, Montgomery County Beekeepers uh, for hosting. As is usual, uh, we're recording this this webinar right now, and it will be made available uh, as of tomorrow through our website. There will be a link on our website um, under the webinars page where there will be a link to the recording where you'll be able to access this. So hopefully uh, other county chapters and other groups uh, going forward that aren't able to participate live this evening, they'll still be able to uh, participate in our discussion after the fact. Um, and so hi to all of you who are, who are viewing that now. Uh, I should mention, uh, however, that this is going to be the last Illuminate recording and webinar that we're going to be able to conduct. Um, that's uh, because NC State is no longer going to be uh, using the Illuminate software package for this type of activity. The good news, however, is that they're upgrading to a, a new and very similar system called uh, uh, Collaborate. Uh, and it's, it's, a very, it's kind of a modern version of this Illuminate. So there'll be certain things that are, that'll be different, but it's, it's actually a little bit easier to, to use, a little more streamlined. Um, and so if you're able and comfortable in using this uh, Illuminate format, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, pretty much the same thing. So uh, all future webinars that we'll be conducting in this series is going to be uh, through that. And the, uh, the same logistics are, are going to apply where uh, there will be um, uh, an email broadcast and, and, and then we'll send you a link to be able to access this uh, type of session online just like you did tonight. So again, thanks everybody for, for coming. and. Um, this evening we're going to be talking about uh, an important aspect of beekeeping uh, about making splits, increasing the number of hives that you have and doing so really this time of year, making splits in the summer th so that they can build up and make it through the winter. So this is a topic that we're going to be talking about that's very relevant, very timely in the sense that uh, this is something you're doing now in preparation for next spring. So um, like many things when it comes to beekeeping, you really need to think ahead. You need to plan well ahead uh, in order to, um, to really become a successful beekeeper and harness the most out of your bees. Now unlike building your equipment during the winter, like you should, and pretty much all beekeepers are guilty of saying, sure, I'll go ahead and do that in the winter. And then, of course, you forget, and then you're building your hive equipment along in the spring just when at your, at your busiest, right? This is something where planning ahead really does pay off and really can um, make things a lot easier down the road if you do uh, the hard work and, and the good planning ahead right now. So uh, before we begin with that topic, I do just want to make a couple quick announcements uh, as to some upcoming events and, um, and activities that you might want to take part in. First and foremost is a couple of very exciting uh, conferences, beekeeping conferences. Of course, the, uh, the summer conference of the North Carolina State Beekeepers Association, which is going to be in Lumberton this year down in Robeson County, uh, July 12th through the 14th. Uh, there are several speakers lined up um, that it, it, it's looking to be a really excellent, as usual, uh, summer conference and banquet, uh, awards banquet um, down in Lumberton. So uh, be sure. It, it's nice and centrally located. Uh, anybody in South Carolina, it's conveniently located for uh, South Carolina beekeepers. Uh, so d uh, definitely be sure to, to try to make that. Uh, if you want to escape the summer heat in August, 
A great place to go is the annual convention, week-long convention, the, the short course and conference of the Eastern Apicultural Society. Now, of course, North Carolina hosted this uh, largest uh, beekeeper meeting in the nation uh, just a couple years ago. This year it's going to be up in Burlington, Vermont. So it's going to be a week later than it's normally held. It's usually held in the first week of August. Uh, this year it's going to be held in the second week of August. But uh, what a great time to be up in the Green Mountains region uh, of, of Vermont. So um, uh, go one day, go the full five days. It's really a one-stop shop for uh, beekeeping at all levels. Uh, it's definitely worth your while. So definitely check that out, uh, both of those conferences out on, on the website. Another thing to point out, and uh, I'm not sure how many people know about this, but since we're speaking to, uh, to several groups here uh, simultaneously, is uh, Honey Bee Awareness Day. This is a singular day event. While the um, National Pollinator Week is in a couple weeks, the last week of, of, of June, and I know that many groups uh, are having activities associated with that, another opportunity is um, Saturday, August 18th, which is, uh, is classified Honey Bee Awareness Day. Uh, and it's something where you might want to consider having some sort of outreach event with the public, Honey Bee Appreciation. Um, more information can be found uh, at this nationalhoneybeeday.com. Um, and uh, they, it's, it's a loose organization uh, whereby you can coordinate activities and, uh, and publicize them. So those are, uh, those are all um, opportunities that beekeepers may want to, uh, to take advantage of. Okay, uh, again, the topic uh, for this month is making increases and making summer splits that can eventually survive the winter. Um, now, much of this topic uh, that I'm going to be presenting this evening it comes almost directly from this book. It's Larry Connor's Increase Essentials, published in 2006. Still very uh, common, commonly found. A very, very uh, well written and insightful book. Uh, something that, if you're interested in this topic, and um, you know, a one-hour uh, webinar is not going to suffice. This is definitely some reading material that you're going to want to pick up. Uh, it's, it's very, very handy, and I'm just going to touch on just some of the things uh, contained within that uh, here tonight. But if, if you want more information, this is a, um, a really good resource that, that I would encourage you to get. But like everything that comes with uh, beekeeping, most everything starts with honeybee biology. And this really is no different, and so that's where I'm going to start. Uh, and understanding the overall uh, the uh, life cycle of a honeybee colony is really critically important to making splits and making increases um, to increase your population for the next year. Uh, and that is because we've just come through this, the very active bee season, right? This is when the main honey flow is. This is when um, everything's going crazy. The colonies are, are really build, building up. There's a huge um, spring uh, population explosion, right? Hopefully not for, for many of you, but uh, it often uh, sometimes accumulates in the, the bees leaving with a swarm. So the old mother queen leaves the nest. New queens are raised within the colony. Those queens then mate and then take over the, the colony. So we're just coming down, and in most parts of the state, we're just coming down from that real intensive colony spring buildup um, that, uh, that is the real busy time for, for beekeepers. So um, hopefully everybody has, has made uh, a decent honey crop, and we're all starting to breathe a little bit easier. However, we're right then looking into the summer, and right now where the main honey flows are gone, there's not going to be too many opportunities, save uh, specialty uh, flows like uh, the sourwood flow or uh, goldenrod flow later on in the summer. Um, most of the honey is made, and most of the population growth is really stabled off. So the colonies are, are kind of flying on autopilot and are uh, about at the, the highest population that, that they're going to attain. They're not going to be building up um, uh, very high. 
Then come in the autumn months, of course, then the queen's going to start laying less. They're going to put more emphasis on storing pollen and, 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 and storing honey in order to make it through the winter, which is the, um, the kind of hibernation season of the bees, waiting for the following spring for the cycle to start all over again. So we're kind of in this, um, in this phase here of where they're kind of stable. They're, um, they're collecting honey, but they're maintaining their population. And what this whole topic is about is trying to manipulate the colonies now to really capture what happens next spring and to, to be able to give the beekeeper as many options as they can uh, and, and to reap some of the benefits of making the, the summer increases now. A lot of people make their colony splits in the spring. And this is actually a very good thing in the spring because it helps mitigate swarming, right? It helps to um, make it so that the brood nest is not congested and you can increase your colony population right in the spring and you, you kill, kind of kill two birds with the one stone, right? You don't have the colony swarm, but you're, making, you're now making two colonies. And that is indeed helpful, but what this topic uh, this, this evening is, is how increases right now making uh, splits during the summer can uh, really be beneficial in different ways than just trying to, to decrease swarming. So when we talk about making splits, when we talk about making increases, we, um, we're really talking about taking one large colony and creating two or more colonies, right? This is uh, something that's pretty unique to, uh, to beekeeping. Those that keep chickens, for example, you can't take one large hen and split it into, and now you have two chickens, right? It's just um, something that's pretty, uh, pretty unique to uh, the social insects and to the superorganism of, of honeybee colonies. Um, in order to accomplish this task, though, you really must be adept at finding the queen. Um, or at the very least, come up with alternatives uh, to being able to, uh, to know where the queen is. And that is because you, you want to physically take the two halves or the multiple components of splitting a colony into multiple hives. You want to take the, uh, the one with the queen, you want to take that a further distance from where they were located originally. Um, and that helps to, to minimize drifting from the original splits back into the original colony. And then, of course, for those colonies that don't have the original queen, you're going to want to have to place new queens into them, and we're going to talk about that uh, later on um, in, in the presentation. Now, the question then becomes, how does one, uh, how many splits per hive? How, how many do you do? Do you split one colony into two? Are there, or do you split one colony into, in this case, four uh, smaller hives, right? Do you take a 20, 20 frame colony and make four or five frame nukes, or do you make two 10 frame splits? Um, and the answer really depends what do you want to get out of doing, making these splits? There are many purposes to doing it. Now, oftentimes, it is best if you're going to make splits, to make them as equal as possible, save for the queen. The queen can only go in one, obviously. But um, to make them equal as possible, that gives each an equal chance to be able to build up at the same rate and at the same get to get to the same stage by the time they go into winter, right? So that's true for two 10-frame splits or the four or five-frame splits. Um, you know, making them equal as possible. This includes all of them having, um, sharing the, the honey and pollen stores, as well as the brood of all different uh, developmental stages, which we'll get to in a second. However, if your purpose is to uh, just decrease swarming, then sometimes it's actually uh, better to uh, not have an equal split, but to take, uh, to leave most of the resources in the original colony and only take out five frames for a nuke. Um, other times, you uh, might want to um, break the brood cycle 
so that the uh, the population of mites within the colony don't build up as quickly. And again, we'll allude to this um, uh, later on in the presentation. So that you, you purposely don't make the splits equal so that you can manipulate the, the growth and development of the colony that's more favorable for certain conditions, such as um, to reducing the mite population. So really, the, the answer to this question is, is something that you need to think about before you even start. How many splits do I want? Why am I trying to make these increases? Do I just want to have insurance colonies for, uh, for next spring in case um, uh, the overwintering population isn't as strong? Uh, is it so that I can increase the, the total number of colonies in my operation? Um, or is it to, uh, to mitigate swarming or for some other purpose? So really, um, the answer to this question is, is entirely up to you and, and part of your beekeeper prerogative. Now, uh, according to the book, uh, there's really two key issues of making that ideal nucleus or that ideal split. Um, and two things have the most significant impact on how well that nucleus split colony is going to build up and grow by the time the, the, the winter season really starts, so that the time that they go into winter. The first uh, deals with the frames of brood. Not only the number of frames of brood, but also uh, the stages of development of that brood. Uh, and we'll see some uh, example graphs of, of how that can affect uh, the overall outcome. Then finally, don't um, underestimate the health of the brood as well. If you go into a really large colony and you want to make a split from it, but one of the frames is just rife with chalk brood, um, that's, not, that's not something that you want to put into a smaller unit in order for them to, to build up. It's going to stymie their growth. Um, you want a uh, brood that, that is uh, not healthy, you want to you remedy that in the strongest possible unit. Things like sack brood, chalk brood, uh, even European fowl brood um, oftentimes are uh, a sign of stress and something that a strong colony can overcome on themselves. If you put uh, a minor case of one of those diseases into a smaller unit that's more stressed out and trying to build up, that might compound the problem. So um, uh, don't forget to, to only in, in these types of uh, making these splits, you really only want to use uh, healthy brood frames here. The second major uh, factor that influences colony growth and development of these splits is the developmental stage of the queen of the, uh, the splits that don't have the original mother queen in it. So, there, there's a whole range of possibilities from uh, um, and just letting the, the bees raise their own from, from a larva uh, to placing a, que um, a ripened queen cell into the colony, uh, placing a virgin unmated queen in there to a laying queen or, or even the mother queen. So depending on what stage in the queen's development from egg to her laying eggs, depending on, on the stage of that, that can have really a, a, important ramifications on how well the colony grows and how quickly it does so. And that can have profound implications for them getting to the point where they're strong enough to be able to overwinter. So here's some uh, example graphs uh, modified from, from Larry Connor's book where he compares, he actually goes through a, a much better calculation, a, a real kind of calculus of going into all the different assumptions and conditions that he's assuming of these growth curves. These are just kind of hand drawn, but they still represent the, the same message. And that is, if you make a split that has 10,000 individuals of adult workers, the number of frames of brood that is included in that split really dictates how quickly the colony builds up and the total population that it can get to over uh, a period of time from now to the end of the fall going into winter. So if there's only one frame of brood, 
then the colony buildup is quite slow. It's quite, it's almost anemic. Uh, and that the colony doubling time is going to be very, very sh uh, long. And by the time they go into the winter, they're probably not going to have the critical mass for the cluster. And they haven't, probably haven't collected enough uh, food stores for the winter to really be able to make it. Uh, if you have three frames of brood, it's a lot better. And uh, maximum here is the five frames of brood, where within that first week or two, you see a real increase. As that brood hatches out and they start emerging, you have a real increase in the population. And then, of course, you have the queen going back in, filling in now voided brood frames with more eggs. There's more nurse bees that are able to tend to that developing brood. And then the colony is much in a much better position uh, to, uh, to increase its population so that it's going to be very strong by the end of the summer. So again, the, um, the number of frames of brood that is placed into the colony is really quite paramount to how well it's going to succeed, not just now, but down the road. Um, I, I meant to include a, another uh, um, graph here uh, that I forgot. Let's see if I can just hand draw it. Um, Please excuse me uh, if, uh, if this doesn't look very good in hand drawing. But another really important issue is not just the number of frames of brood, but the developmental stages of brood. Um, if you put in, let's say, three frames of, of brood, but they're all capped brood, or they're all about one week from, from emerging, what you're going to have is you're going to have some sort of step function, right, where you have the, the brood all emerging all at the same time, but the queen can only lay at a certain rate, about 12 or so 100 eggs a day. And so you see this very quick increase, but then a long anemic period where there aren't any more bees coming out. And so, and then you have something more like a step function where the colony isn't going to build up quite as quickly because all of that brood emerged at once, and then, um, uh, and then there was no more brood emerging uh, uh, afterwards. So that's if uh, you put in three frames of all cap brood. On the other hand, if you put in, say, all frames of young larvae of all open brood, and you're going to have to wait a couple weeks, two, two weeks, before the brood starts hatching. And then again, you have this step function where it doesn't quite build up as quickly. Right? So the ideal uh, in putting in multiple frames of brood is to have a, a representative cohort of all the different developmental stages, larvae, white-eyed pupae, purple-eyed pupae, and soon-to-emerge pupae, so that as those bees emerge, they do so kind of continuously rather than, uh, than uh, periodically. And so that, uh, that can really also help in just the normal growth function of, of the split. So it's not just the number of frames of brood, but also the, uh, the types of frames of brood. Now, similarly, uh, looking at the developmental stage of the queen, um, this is uh, also incredibly important. This is where it's, it's, it's vital to know the developmental phase of, of queens. Now, we all know that it takes 16 days for a queen to develop from egg to adult. So she emerges from her cell after about 16 days. Now, after that 16 days, it then takes another week or so for her to become sexually mature. Um, and then it takes about another week for her to mate, to fly from the hive, assuming perfect weather and everything goes well, for her to fly from the hive, to mate, store the sperm with all of her mates, 
and then gear up all of her egg-laying machinery. So she, in order to fly, she doesn't have um, uh, mature ovaries or, or the capacity to lay eggs. So that takes two, three, four days for those eggs to start develop and mature so that she can start laying them. And then, of course, the moment she lays that first egg, it takes three weeks for that egg to develop into a worker, right? So you're talking a period, a, a hiatus of brood rearing for, for quite a long period of time. So the sooner, or I, I should say the longer, the further down the, um, oh dear, that's a really ugly picture. Uh, by the way, um, uh, just on a side note, if anybody, uh, I see that there's kind of the grayscale. You can actually change the video. Uh, there's a scroll bar there down to fine color, which makes it look more like TV rather than you're looking at some blob of, of me lecturing. But uh, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. That actually might not be such a bad thing to leave me as a gray blob. Anyway, what I was saying is that the, the further down that developmental trajectory that the queen is, that you're putting into these splits, the better. So the sooner she can start laying eggs, uh, the, the, the quicker the colony development will be. So if you start out with, uh, say, a three-frame a, a three frame split uh, of all correct developmental stages, and then you introduce a new laying queen, then that colony is gonna um, is gonna take off and start building up because the queen from from pretty much from day one, she's gonna be able to start replacing those bees that are emerging, and the colony is gonna be able to uh, to grow as a result. If, however, you put in a mature queen cell into that colony. Then again, the next uh, within the next day or two, she's going to emerge. But then it's going to take another week for her to become sexually mature, another week for her to start laying eggs, and then three weeks before the population starts uh, to increase. So by placing a queen cell into the colony, it's not going to do nearly as well. If you let the colony just raise their own queen. Um, and not even place in uh, a, you know, a 15, 14 day old queen cell, you let them raise a queen from a newly hatched egg, that's going to add on two more weeks onto that whole hiatus of brood uh, rearing. And they're going to hatch out all of that brood before any new eggs are going to start to be laid. So that, that really deters the development of these splits, of just letting them raise their own. Now again, as I alluded to earlier, sometimes that can be uh, useful. You can harness that power by not having any um, uh, young larvae for varroa mites to parasitize. So it breaks the brood cycle and actually uh, causes problems for the mites to, um, to take hold within a colony. So you can harness that uh, capacity. But uh, you, if you're, if you're, um, if that's not the purpose of making the split, then that can actually really kind of detract from the growth of the colony. So again, uh, these are, are factors that you have control over as, as a beekeeper, and you can uh, get out of them of what you need to get out. But if you want the colony to, to really build up and become strong by the end of the summer, then uh, the lay, a laying queen that you introduce into the splits is going to be uh, much more effective. Now, as you make splits in the, in the spring or um, during a major honey flow or as you're installing packages, we often use foundation, right? And this is obviously really good to get new comb built within your colonies and uh, having new comb is, is definitely a good thing. However, during this time of year, the midsummer, uh, placing splits and then uh, you know flanking them or, or caught, uh, putting foundation into those splits, causing them to build their own comb is really going to retard the growth and development of, of those colonies. It's going to make it a lot harder for them to build up um, and make it uh, to be strong colonies by the end of the summer. And that's because in a major nectar flow, bees are much more poised, much more willing, much uh, more able 
to build new cone because it takes a lot of energy uh, to, to build that new wax cone. For splits in the midsummer, you want that energy rather than going into making wax, you want it to be going into making bees so that then those bees can store food for the, for the winter. So uh, it takes about nine pounds of honey in order to make one pound of wax. So the more frames of foundation you put into these colonies, just think of all of that energy that you're taking away from the bees later on down the road. Again, you really have to be thinking well ahead in the season when, when you're doing these types of splits. You want to make sure that you're not setting them up for failure later on. So really avoid using a foundation, if at all possible. Use only drawn comb as you're making these splits. Now, uh, similarly, uh, it, when one is establishing a, a new package or one is um, uh, uh, starting a new colony with foundation in the spring, it's really important to, to, to make sure that they have sufficient food sources so that they can draw out that comb by providing supplemental sugar syrup. Um, this can also help not for drawing out comb, but for getting the colony established so that, um, so that they can uh, uh, start building up the brood and, and getting um, that colony population as strong as it can be by, by the end of the summer. Um, also, don't forget, uh, if necessary and if helpful, for feeding not just supplemental sugar syrup, but uh, uh, supplemental uh, pollen, or a pollen substitute, some sort of protein that can help the brood rearing. Uh, also outside of major nectar flows is often uh, a deficiency of good pollen sources as well. So depending on your area, uh, making sure that they have enough of both of their food sources in order to put those resources into making more bees is, uh, is really, really helpful. Now, so far we've been talking about uh, the, the developmental stages and the type of brood that you put into the splits. Uh, and again, there's, there's no magic number. You don't need you know, two frames. You can get away with one frame. It's better to have five frames depending on how quickly you want them to build up. Um, but these are all uh, important factors to consider. But once you make that split, you're kind of at a, under a ticking clock by making sure that they're going to somehow be able to have a queen, and as I said before, a queen that hopefully will start to lay eggs sooner rather than later. So in doing so, it's really, really helpful to raise your own queens. So uh, I just want to ask everybody, uh, if you can, by, uh, by using the little raise your hand tool on the left hand side underneath the participants window, how many people uh, raise your uh, raise your own queens? So we have uh, 43 uh, individuals logged on. Although I know there are uh, eight or so county chapters out there. Oh, and about 12, 13 of you. So not quite half. About a third almost exactly a third of you uh, raise your own queen. So that's, um, that's really, actually really good. Uh, I'm sure many more beekeepers um, unintentionally raise their own queens, right? When uh, queens uh, get lost in a swarm or something like that, or if you accidentally uh, crush you know, the resident queen in between the two frames or something unfortunate like that. Uh, but you know, here, of course, I mean uh, on, on purpose, raising your queens for these particular purposes. So uh, that's really uh, excellent. Uh, so many people are uh, able and, and willing to raise your own queens. And with a little know-how, and again, a lot of planning and timing, making sure things match up uh, uh, on the correct days, it's, it's actually a relatively straightforward and simple and really fun thing to do is to, is to raise your own queens. It's one of the most rewarding aspects uh, of beekeeping. And so we definitely encourage anybody who's able and willing to do that to do so. So if you are interested, um, there are, are, in essence, three 
main conditions that you need in order to raise your own queens. Now hopefully this is not done in your splits themselves, but rather in uh, another larger colony that will raise many queens, but then you could use those queens to um, introduce into, uh, into, your own, into your own colonies. The first and foremost, of course, is that there can't be a queen present in that queen rearing colony. The queen pheromone deter deters workers from raising queens, so you can't have a queen present in a colony from which you want to raise queens. Because queen larvae are fed royal jelly, uh, royal jelly is a glandular secretion from the nurse bees. You need lots of nurse bees within the colonies. Um, so that they can provision the, the queen larvae and that they can be raised properly. It's been estimated you need uh, about two to 400 nurse bees in order to raise a single queen larva. So depending on how many queens you want to raise, you need a colony that is correspondingly large enough to be able to raise all of those, all of those uh, developing queens. The third is because uh, royal jelly is very proteinaceous, it's very rich, it takes a lot of resources, the colonies have to be very well fed with honey or supplemental uh, uh, sugar water and protein especially. Good frames of, pro of pollen or uh, pollen substitute if, uh, if that's not uh, possible. So um, you, can rate, you can set up a colony uh, uh, fairly readily by taking out its queen, making sure it's well fed, uh, and making sure there's a lot of young bees in it. And um, then you're able to raise your own queens. Now you want to do this well ahead of time of actually making the split if you want to requeen those splits with laying queens. Now there are many different ways that you can raise queens. Uh, and I'll just go through this very briefly. I won't, I won't uh, uh, dwell on it too long. Uh, but there's a whole range of different ways that you can raise queens from the very um, exotic and uh, very high tech using these uh, queen rearing systems like the Yenter system, which is this plastic cassette that you, you place queens into. There's a fake plastic comb that the queens will lay eggs into and then you pull out the back with the eggs hanging on them and then place those eggs into these uh, plastic holders that you place into that queen rearing colony and um, they will then uh, raise them as queens. So this is a, a way that you can, without uh, physically moving, or, or you are physically moving the eggs and larvae um, from this Yenta system to a new colony, but uh, it, it's, it, the work is all done for you. It's very, very seamless. The kind of standard way that, um, that many beekeepers raise their queens is through this uh, grafting method called the Doolittle method. Uh, this is the uh, physical transfer of young worker larvae from uh, worker comb into queen cup cells that are then placed into uh, the queen rearing colonies and then uh, the bees will start provisioning those larvae with royal jelly and they'll develop normally as queens. So this is a, a very common practice that, that most beekeepers um, and most queens are, are raised by. Uh, another way that you can raise queens is just kind of, um, is kind of by this old fashioned method called the Miller method. Uh, and this is where you can take a frame of foundation and you can cut them into triangles to kind of maximize the, the surface area of the uh, edge of the comb. And then you place this into a colony, let them draw it out, let the queen lay uh, eggs and young larvae in this newly drawn wax. And then you take this frame out and you put it into that queenless colony and they'll start raising queen cells, kind of like emergency queen cells, but from these very uh, young eggs and young larvae and they hang down off of the edge of the cone so they can be easily cut out with a razor blade and then taken out and placed into, into other colonies. So this is another way where you don't have to lift each individual larva one by one, you can just kind of do it in, in, as in bulk. The final way you can do it is just don't even worry about it. Just uh, let the bees do it themselves. 
if you take a queen out of a colony or you make one of these splits, as long as they have uh, eggs and young larvae, they will make emergency queen cells. And so what they do is they don't move the eggs uh, from worker cells into queen cells. They actually transform the comb, the wax comb, around uh, a dozen or so worker larvae and they'll build it out and start provisioning that larva royal jelly and it'll develop into a normal queen. They'll kind of build it out and down and so those will make uh, normal queens. So this is obviously the easiest way to go about it where you pretty much do nothing. But as we'll, we'll talk about in a moment, there, um, there's pros and cons to each of these uh, different tactics. Especially in that last tactic, um, it, as we talk, talked about before, this is the same figure uh, that we were talking about earlier, that uh, having the emergency queen take over a split, it's going to take weeks and weeks for that colony to really start building up again. So um, having a laying queen, one that's already been mated and started to lay, is going to be much better requeening these splits uh, so that the, the colonies will, will become established much more readily. If that in and of itself is, is not reason enough um, to favor raising your own queens and having them mate before um, you put them into the splits rather than raise your own, this is another reason why uh, it's, it's often better not to let colonies raise their own queens through these kind of emergency queen rearing methods and uh, raising your own through, um, through some other means. And that's because, this is kind of a complicated figure, but let me, let me walk you through it. Uh, on the left hand side here is, is the reproductive quality of queens, kind of ranging from very high quality, she's large, she's very fecund, she lays a lot of eggs, she produces a lot of pheromone, you know, so very high quality queen. But then you can have some really low quality queens, real, real um, uh, poor egg layers, um, they're, they're not very fecund. And there's a whole range in queens. And what most people don't realize is that that range in reproductive quality of queens can vary as a function of when the individual larva is raised as a queen. So the process of grafting, the process of taking a new queen, taking a worker larva, putting it into a queen cell, is that they start, they start feeding it royal jelly at a certain point. And if it's early enough, if it's just hatched from its uh, egg casing, then it will make a very high quality queen because it's spent pretty much every day of its larval development being fed as a queen. However, if you start raising uh, queens from worker larvae that are two or three day old worker larvae, so in their uh, fourth, fifth, or even sixth day of, of total life, then what's going to end up happening is that the quality of the resultant queen is going to go down. She's already spent two or three days being fed worker food and not fed queen food the entire time. And so the resultant queen is actually going to be more worker-like. And now obviously after two and a, or three and a half days, you can, you can transfer a really old worker larva and it will never be raised as a queen. So there's kind of a, a point of no return after which you can't, you can't raise your own queen. Um, but in, in an emergency queen, uh, queen rearing condition, the workers raise a wide, a wide age of queens from different age larvae. So many of them are raised from one day old larvae. Some are raised from two day, uh, two day old larvae or even three day old larvae. Now what happens then is that as these emergency queen cells uh, mature, the first ones that emerge are going to go around and destroy the other queen cells and therefore take over the colony. Well, guess which ones are going to be the first ones that emerge? It's the ones that are, were raised from the older worker larvae and therefore not going to be as good a queen. They're going to be more worker-like. So this is where the, the colony, they want to replace their queen as quickly as possible, but they're doing so 
by replacing it with perhaps not the best possible queen. Now, oftentimes they, they can produce a, a very good and viable queen, but sometimes they don't. So by letting nature take its course in this way, you're actually rolling the dice sometimes and you're, the, the, the bees are trying to requeen at the expense of requeening with the best possible queen. So this is where you as the beekeeper can really help and um, raise the queens ahead of time and then place them into the colony so that they're, they're not, they don't have that hiatus, but they also don't, don't run the risk of having a queen that might not be as high quality as she perhaps could be. So that's a long way of saying that it's, it's a very good idea to, to raise queens in preparation for making the splits rather than making the splits and having them requeen on their own. Now, if you do that, if you do raise your own queens, then before they emerge, you need to take them out and you need to place them into their own colonies in order for them to emerge, mature, mate, and then start laying eggs. Now, again, this can be done by placing those queen cells into the splits that you make up, but it's going to take, you know, another week or two for her to start laying eggs um, and, and to really uh, start building up the colony again. If you have the resources and you are capable, you can use any number of types of small uh, baby nukes or, or mating nukes, or there are these uh, mini nukes, these two frame nukes that are slightly larger where they have three combs about that size, or you can just use uh, five frame nukes where you're having the queens emerge in these nukes and mate and then once they've been verified to start laying eggs, then you can pull them out and introduce them into your splits. So again, the further down the line you are as far as queen developmental time, uh, the faster that the splits are going to be um, once you've established them. Now, this might not be um, feasible, obviously, for all beekeepers, especially those with, uh, with small colony numbers or don't have specialized equipment. So you're, we're all constrained by what we're able and wanting to do. But if you really want to maximize um, the, the, the buildup of, of the splits this time of year to get them ready for the winter, then uh, that's the, one of the, the strongest ways that you can do that. Now, in uh, mating the queens, of course, they have to have somebody to mate with. So there has to be a sufficient drone population in the area if you're going to mate queens. Now, this is regardless if you're grafting your own, you're using mating nukes or the enter system or anything like that. If, if, even if you're letting nature take its course and you're letting emergency queens take over your splits, if you're doing that, and that queen is mature and starts mate taking mating flights and there are no drones for her to mate with or there are very, very few drones, then that again is a very, very bad thing. So you need to plan ahead not just the developmental time of the split, the developmental time of the queens, but you need to take into account the developmental time and the sexual maturity of the local drones. So you want to make sure that there are enough drones and drone brood within your colonies and preferably within your neighbor's colonies because those are the ones hopefully that your queens are going to be made with. Um, you want to make sure there's a good enough genetic diversity among those drone sources. That is, you don't want uh, sister queens mating with brother drones uh, to avoid inbreeding, pr inbreeding problems. And a good rule of thumb is that um, you want to start raising queens when you have cap drone brood. Because if you look at the developmental phases of how long it takes for drones to mature, emerge, and then become sexually mature, that's about the time when you want to start raising queens uh, so that they become sexually mature and take mating flights at the same time. So in essence, if you're making splits or you're making queens and you're doing so and you go into your colonies and you don't have any cats drone brood, then you might want to rethink about what you're doing because um, by the time your queens become mature, they might not have uh, many drones to mate with. So it's another uh, thing that you need to think about as you're going through this whole process. Now once you have, a, say, a mated queen, 
uh, from that either you've raised or one that you've purchased or one that you're taking from another colony. Uh, you want to make sure that it's introduced correctly into one of your summer splits. And the way to do that um, is this is uh, there, there are many different types of clean cages out there, but the, the standard one is this uh, Benton mailing cage, right? It's that that worker, or I'm sorry, that wooden cage. It has the three holes drilled into it, and then the screen on the outside, right? So uh, the the way to introduce that to a new colony is you want to make sure, if you can. Uh, remove any of the, any attendants that are on the inside. You can temporarily take out the, one of the corks on one of the ends uh, and let the workers come out and make sure the queen's alone in there. Uh, studies have shown that uh, worker attendants in there tend to decrease the acceptance of a foreign queen into a colony. Another thing to do is you want to uh, take out the cork from the, the side of the chamber where the queen candy is located, right? That's that candy plug that acts as a time release mechanism so that the workers slowly chew out this candy and kind of time release the queen so that by the time she has access to the combs and, and is released from the cage, she smells like the workers and they're going to be much more uh, readily accepting of her, right? In doing that, you want to make sure that the candy end is up rather than down. And that is because um, sometimes, you know, if the queen gets weak and she, uh, the, the, or the, the candy itself can get gummy if it's very humid, and the queen can get stuck in there. So by keeping it up, it's going to be less likely that she's going to get gummed up and, and, uh, and die before she, she actually gets released. A lot of books or a lot of uh, kind of beekeeping advice says what you need to do is you need to take a nail and you need to jam that through the, the candy so that you know gives them a head start in, in getting that candy out. Um, that really isn't recommended because it will accelerate them releasing her so quickly that it actually might be way too fast and that they're not going to um, accept her as readily. So you actually want this process to take two, three days rather than overnight. Um, you're, you're really rolling the dice in, in accepting a queen if she's released too quickly. Now one last thing that you need to do after you make these, these splits, um, and especially if they have um, lots of young larvae from which they can raise their own emergency queens, even if you put a caged queen in the next day after you've made the split, um, she's not going to be producing enough queen pheromone and, and transmitting it because she doesn't have access to the workers fully yet. Um, they're not going to be deterred. They're not going to be inhibited from making their own queen cells. So they're going to be raising their own queens. And uh, you know, you spent all this time and energy or even money in placing a, a newly mated queen in this cage. And then if they raise their own queens, they'll prefer that queen over yours and um, you, you've just wasted all of that effort. So you really need to make sure you go in seven to eight days later into whatever splits were made that don't have any queens in it and go through frame by frame and destroy any developed queen cells that uh, are found on those combs. In doing so, and I really can't stress this enough, it is really worth your while to shake off all the bees from those frames, every single frame, and check for queen cells. It may be very disruptive, it may be very chaotic, but it is worth your while to do that because some of these queen cells can be very cryptic, they can be hidden under little pieces of burr comb, they can be tucked away, they can look like drone cells. Um, so you really need to inspect them carefully. It can be very hard with all the bees crawling over them uh, for, for you to, to identify a lot of these capped queen cells. So you want to go through frame by frame and excise all of these queen cells uh, so that the ones that you introduce into your splits are the ones that are going to uh, be taking over. And again, start laying eggs right away rather than waiting several weeks for these emergency queen cells to, um, to start up. 
Now, one last thing that um, you might want to consider, especially if you're making uh, later summer splits and, and you're able to, to acquire queens and raise queens, um, you might want to consider uh, what's known as stove piping or, or having uh, double nukes uh, rather than uh, putting them overwintering in 10 frame equipment. I think this is something that isn't done uh, quite as often as, as perhaps it should. You know, bees like tend to, to move up. They like to move up, especially in the winter time. So if you have a, a very strong, um, strong five frame nuke, a, f a five frame split, and you want to uh, have it build up to go into winter, you have a nice strong colony that has 10 frames that's kind of lateral, then what happens after winter is that they, they, they tend to move sideways through the, um, you know, through the combs eating the honey. And sometimes the worst case scenario is that the cluster, the winter cluster actually splits and often they, they, if it's really cold they might not have the critical mass to stay warm. And so moving laterally can, can sometimes confuse the cluster and, and, and cause problems as the, the bees are coming out of winter. If you do the stove piping idea where you're putting those extra five frames rather to the side filled with honey, you do it on top, then the cluster actually, they, they eat the honey in the lower chamber and then they move up and there's less, um, less opportunity for the, for the cluster to split or for them to, um, uh, to, to otherwise experience problems moving laterally. And, and what you end up having then at the, at the end of the summer is, or at the end of the winter coming out of summer is you have an empty box that you can then place on top of the colony in order for them to start building up uh, very well. So in, in a lot of parts of North Carolina, you can get away with this, and you can get away with overwintering, overwintering nukes. It's not the size of the colony or the size of the population. It's the ratio of that cluster to where the food is. And so this is another advantage of making splits this time of year, where you, if you, if you play your cards right, you will be able to overwinter the nukes rather than uh, overwintering Ten frame uh, uh, equipment um, because they might not have enough time to build up to, to 20 frame, frame uh, equipment or, or larger. So it's another um, option to making splits this time of year. So just uh, a lot of the benefits and, and some of the other benefits that we've alluded to but haven't really uh, talked about in making these mid to late uh, summer splits. Um, I, I said before that if you're making unequal splits, that is, you're, you're not taking frames of brood uh, that's representative of all the different uh, developmental phases, you can purposely break the brood cycle. And, that, and, and this is true this time of year because the varroa populations within the colonies are really, really starting to escalate. Just as the, the, the adult bee population is, is leveling off and, and in the fall going to start going back down. So if you can break that escalation to the point where, where the, the mites can't find any adequate uh, brood in which to parasitize, that can really um, uh, deter their population growth and therefore be a, a non-chemical means of controlling varroa within your colony. So this, is, this can be a very powerful method. Of course, there's no free lunch. The downside is that the split itself is going to have a harder time uh, growing to the point where it's going to be strong enough and making it through the winter. But it, it can be a, a, a means by which you can, can help uh, control varroa populations. Another thing is that having a queen right now that's just going to start laying this time of year and then start slowing down by, by, um, by the fall and going into winter. Next spring, she's going to be, in essence, a new queen. She's going to be a first year queen. And research has shown that first year queens have a much lower swarming propensity than second year queens or older queens. And so by raising queens now and making up these splits and, and making new colonies now, it actually can save you some headache next spring by lessening the, uh, the chances that the colonies are going to swarm. Now, it's obviously 
it, you still have to do all of the things you need to do for swarm mitigation, make sure they don't get congested. But it's just one extra thing that might make it a little bit easier that they're going to be less likely to swarm. Another thing, and I'm sure most people in the audience right now had had problems either earlier this spring or even right now trying to locate queens when you need them, right? Everybody wants queens in April, and boy, everybody sold out, right? It is really, really difficult to get queens then because that's when everybody wants them. That's when the demand is greatest. Right now, the de demand is not so great. Unfortunately, the supply isn't so great either. So it may be uh, difficult from a lot of the, the large um, queen suppliers to find uh, adequate queens. All the more reason of why raising your own queens can be very beneficial. Uh, but um, still, the demand is a lot less, so a lot of those uh, large uh, queen sources may have queens still yet available, and therefore it's going to be easier to secure. So the mad rush is over this time of year versus a couple months ago. And then finally, um, by making up many small colonies right now, it's a way to, to actually hedge your bets and, and increase your options either going into winter or coming out of winter. So if you have lots of queens and lots of kind of smaller colonies, um, if some of them aren't building up like you think they should, or if some of them they just don't have as good a queen as another, this allows you to, to combine the colonies now or, or in the fall when you still have time to make those types of decisions rather than letting um, colonies over weak colonies over winter and not be able to make it. So there's the, you know the famous famous beekeeper expression that says take your winter losses in the fall. This is a good way to kind of hedge that. If if you don't have enough colonies to 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 merge back together or um, to to help uh, serve as as a reservoir for extra queens, then your options are going to be very limited. But by making splits that can then increase your chances of, of being able to go into winter with as strong colonies as you possibly can. And then you'll be coming out of winter uh, uh, looking in really good shape. So uh, to summarize, um, as long as you can buy your queens or preferably uh, you know, make your own this time of year, you really should be able to, to make your own splits. It's not too late. Uh, there is a point in the season when it is too late, uh, but right now is not the time. This is still uh, a perfectly reasonable and, in fact, sometimes beneficial time for you to increase your colony numbers. The, the number of frames of brood really impact how quickly and how well that colony builds up, as well as the developmental stages of those brood, so that you want all developmental stages represented in those splits for even normal colony growth. Queens that are earlier in their developmental uh, ages, that is, uh, letting them raise their own or, or, or raising or placing in queen cells into the splits, that can actually retard the growth of the splits because it's going to take time for those queens to become sexually mature, mate, and start laying eggs. So the more mature the queens are that are placed into the splits, the quicker that they're going to take off and start to become productive. And again, as I mentioned in the previous slide, there are many other intangibles to increasing your numbers this year to ensure you have good, strong colonies coming out of winter next year. So by planning ahead, you're really able to, to maximize your options and be able to, to overcome a lot of unforeseen problems that you may not be able to predict. And then finally, all of this is really contingent upon knowing the developmental timelines of the queens. You want to do your splits when you know your queens are going to be mature. You want to know the developmental stages and the, the emerging brood cycles of the frames that you're placing into your colonies. You want to be able to predict the foraging season. If there's a fall honey flow in your area, you want to make sure that the colony is growing and established at that time. So you want to make sure you track back in the season so that you start making your splits in preparation for colonies to be ready for that. Right? 
Uh, you'll want to make these splits too late in the season so they're not going to have adequate time to build up in order to make it through the winter. So understanding all of these different kind of moving timelines of queen developmental time, colony developmental time, brood developmental time, and your local foraging ecology is really, really critical. And this is where knowing that kind of all-encompassing information about your bees is, is really important. But once you're able to do that, um, this can be a very powerful technique for you to employ uh, beekeepers of all sizes. And with that, uh, before uh, we uh, end and, and I take questions, I just want to remind you to save the next date of the next webinar in, in our series here. It's going to be uh, September 4th, which I believe is a Tuesday, uh, September 4th, 2012. This one's going to be hosted by the Haywood County Beekeepers, thanks to all you guys up in the mountains, uh, to, to host this next webinar. Uh, the tentative topic for, for this is going to be um, a, a recap of some of the research that we've been doing here at NC State in our apiculture program. We hope to have some uh, preliminary data for you on some of the things that we have going on. Uh, if not, if, if it's still that's going to be premature, uh, we'll definitely let, let you guys know uh, what that topic is going to be. But for now, make sure you save the date and uh, be on the lookout uh, through Cooperative Extension or through the county listserv for uh, an announcement. And again, this is going to be through the new software package called Collaborate rather than Illuminate, but it's going to, uh, in essence, be uh, very, very similar. So with that, uh, thanks everybody for your attention. And I'd be happy to take some questions. You can applaud if you want, yes just so that I know you're not all asleep. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> okay, so there, there were um, a bunch of uh, things that were um, typed in here. Uh, there was a question here that says, uh, is the case method a practical method for hobby beekeepers? So I'm, I'm assuming that you're referring to the, um, to the Yenter kit for raising queens. Um, this, is, uh, oops, this is a very elaborate system for raising your own queens. And, and again, I won't go into too much details here, but um, I, forget the, I forget the latest cost of this. It's probably about 100 bucks or something like that. Um, but the, the idea is, especially if, if the, this do-little method, this grafting method, where you take a little metal hook and you scoop out these larvae that are so small you can barely see them, if that's problematic for you, then actually these Yenter kits can, can be even more helpful because you don't have to physically see or touch the larvae. Uh, the queen lays the egg in a cell, and then you take out the back of the cell that has the egg attached to it. And then you simply click it into one of these plastic uh, rigs and then put it into your cell builder. So it actually can be fairly amenable for, uh, for beekeepers of all, of all sizes. Uh, you don't have to be large scale in, in order to, uh, to utilize these. But they are tricky. They do, they do take um, a little practice and, and a little usage. So um, it's not for the faint-hearted, but it's certainly worth a try and, and it's quite enjoyable when you're able to, to, get, to get it down. Uh, how late in the Piedmont would be too late to split a hive? Uh, that of course depends on the year. Uh, that uh, you know it can be it can be pretty hard to predict um, exactly how late is too late. But um, really, what you need to, to think about is um, maybe we can just do this uh, together as we uh, work through this as a thought experiment. Usually, um, we like to have our colonies down for for winter. Um, at the uh, end of October at the very latest, right? So if you count backwards from that point where you want to have a good, strong um, foraging population, say middle of October or even the beginning of October, but let's say worst case scenario, middle of October, then you need to count three weeks back from that, right? Because that is when the bees start uh, coming from the hives and start foraging. Right? So now we're talking the end of September. Three weeks back from that is when the bees 
um, were emerging from their cells, right? So now we're talking, say, mid to uh, early September. And then three weeks back from that is when the queen needed to start laying eggs, right? So now we're talking the end of August. That's one brood cycle. So if you make splits in, say, late August, you're really pushing it for that colony to have enough population turnover to grow strong enough to make it through the winter. So I would say, um, you know, that uh, July is probably um, around the latest time that you would want to start making these splits so that they've had enough time for one or two brood cycles to go into winter. Um, if anybody disagrees w with that, that's um, something that you can discuss amongst yourselves. That's, that's just, again, something to think about as you're looking at the calendar and as you're thinking about colony development in these different timelines. Uh, let's see, that means about honey, not about uh, nukes. How far should nukes be moved after requeening? Excellent question. Um, the, the ideal, the, the reason that when you make a split and you keep the, the mother queen and the original colony and the split side by side, um, what ends up happening is all the bees that went into the splits, especially the forager bees that went into the queenless half, they're going to fly from the colony and then come back to the original mother colony. Right? So you're going to have a lot of drift, so you might split them equally, but over the course of a couple days, the population is going to be unequal again because more bees are going to go back to the original colony with the, with the queen mother. Right? So you want to move the mother queen a good mile away or so outside of the foraging radius of the original colony so that the, um, the bees that uh, in the split are, um, are returning back to that split and not going back to the, the, the original colony. Now, if you're making more than one split from the, uh, from the mother colony, that is, you're making, say, you're taking one colony, you're making four out of it, you actually want to take the three queenless halves, you want to take those away from the colony and leave the mother queen behind. Uh, and that's because if you leave the three um, splits behind, then they're all going to drift, all the foraging bees are going to drift back into whichever one was placed in the original uh, colony spot, right? And you're going to have the same problem of drift. So the whole idea is that you want to make sure that um, the, 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 whichever colonies you move, they're going to be moved further away from the foraging radius of that site to minimize bees going back to the original apiary. Anything to do to reduce risk of robbing with splits and nukes in mid-summer? Oh boy. Amen. Um, this can be a real problem, right? Once that main nectar flow is over, and especially with Italian bees, um, they, they tend to be notorious for really uh, being snoopy and, and wanting to rob other colonies and it's the larger colonies that pick on the smaller colonies, right? So when you're making these splits and they're only 10,000 strong and you're trying to build them up, they can be real targets for stronger colonies. So you're absolutely right. I should have mentioned that. You want to be very careful with that. One way to do that is to use robber screens or otherwise uh, uh, entrance reducers. So for small populations of workers, um, that they're going to be able to defend that colony from the larger colonies. Uh, another thing is that you don't want to, um, once you see robbing going, you want to try and stop it as quickly as you can. You want to stop working, you want to put all the lids on the hive and, and, and screen things up so that the entrance of the colony is only as big as what the, the work the, the guard bees are able to guard. Um, this, this can be a real issue, and that's, that's a very good and important point to make there. So when making a split, what is the optimum ratio of brood to pollen to honey? Uh, again, another excellent question there. Um, 
it, it depends on when. If there is a, a midsummer flow, like if you if you're lucky enough to be up uh, where there's sour wood or something like that in the middle of July, um, then you probably don't need as, as many honey stores. Um, but uh, typically, what you want with with a five frame split, what I like to do is I like to have two frames of honey, and then three frames of brood. Preferably one of those frames of brood with, with a good amount of pollen on them. So two frames of, fruit, of food, three frames of brood. That's about the ratio that you want. Um, again, there, there's no magic number here. It's something that, that um, there's a lot of flexibility here. But what you don't want is too much of one and not enough of the other. You definitely want some of all of the above, right? And then that way the colony is, is not going to be the pauper of a particular resource and they're, they're, um, they're, they have to adjust to that. So, uh, but usually that, that three to two uh, ratio is, is usually pretty good. Uh, could mite chemical involved cause severe problems? Okay, so could uh, mite, uh, using mites, uh, treating mites in the fall cause queen problems for spring buildup? So um, it's, and that's a really important point um, in that if you're raising queens this time of year, this is also the time of year, it might be early now, but it's still the time of year when we need to be on top of mite populations. And if you're using synthetic acaricides especially, uh, but even any of the other mite treatments like the thymol treatment or, or um, uh, formic acid or something like that, Raising queens and colonies that are b actively being treated for mites have real, real problems. In fact, it's so problematic for those really nasty synthetic acaricides uh, like kumaphos that even the residual kumaphos in the wax can be problematic for raising queens. So this is another reason why letting them requeen on their own, if you're simultaneously treating for mites, they might not raise any queens. And this happens uh, more and more frequently uh, among, um, among beekeepers. And it's, it's uh, something that once they get to that point, they, then they can become hopelessly queenless and um, there's really not much that you can do. Now, um, if you can raise queens, and in fact we're doing some experiments on this and others have as well, where non-toxic levels of some of these miticides can cause problems in the queens that cause them to have, uh, they're, they're just lower quality. They don't build up as well. They may not lay as well. They may not store their sperm as well. Uh, so there can be problems for that. So yes, in raising queens, you definitely want to make sure, just like when you're making honey, you can't have your uh, uh, treatments in your colony if you choose to use those. Same thing for making queens. It's an absolute no-no um, to be taking care of mites at the same time. Here's another uh, interesting question. It says, in September, should the queen be killed and let the hive requeen so she's a virgin for February? Absolutely not. Uh, and the reason that is is because there's a uh, queens have uh, you know an internal clock. They have a receptive time that they're able to make. Um, if they go into winter as a virgin, then they'll start laying eggs even if they've never made it and um, they become then drone layers. So an unmated queen can still lay eggs, those eggs are still viable, but they only develop in the males. So after about 40 days, give or take two or three weeks even, um, queens eventually will give up mating. So you can confine virgin queens uh, for a long period of time, but at some point, if they haven't made it, they're going to start laying eggs no matter what. So you're not able to, unfortunately, to bank virgin queens over the winter and have them come out of winter and then mate. They need to mate within the first week or two of their lives, and then they'll store that sperm. So if they mate in July uh, and they mate with an adequate number of drones, they've really, they haven't tapped into their sperm, their stored sperm very much going into winter so that they are going to be uh, new but fully mated come next spring. That, but that's a really interesting question and, and good thought uh, process and good tactic 
but it's something that, that I don't think is actually uh, going to be feasible in most cases. So uh, here's a, a, another interesting question that kind of goes um, uh, to that point about uh, raising, um, uh, letting colonies raise their own. So uh, that um, some queens or some uh, workers tear down um, the bad queen cells in order to keep the good queen cells. So that kind of harkens back to, to this figure here. Um, where the lower quality queens are, are preferentially torn down by the workers to allow these higher quality queens. And while that's true, they're not surgeons about it. Uh, they are not precise and they're not uh, entirely accurate. So while they do tend to, to tear down a higher proportion of these queens raised from these older worker larvae compared to these queens that are um, raised from younger larvae that are going to make the better quality queens, it's, um, it's not precise. You can't necessarily rely on that. Uh, so again, it's, it's like rolling the dice. Oftentimes they, they do, and they do make perfectly good emergency queen supersedure queens, but uh, uh, sometimes they don't, and this is the reason why they don't, um, at which point uh, at which point um, you, uh, you don't, um, you might not want to leave uh, uh, fate to chance like that. Um, now there, there may be ways to have your cake and eat it too. Uh, and I, I've, been, I've been wanting to test this for a while, but I haven't. And that is, you go in, you make a split such as this, and you let the colonies raise their own queens. But you go in five days later, or I'm sorry, six days later, and any queen cell that is capped at that point had to have derived from an older worker larva. If you go into those colonies and you tear down all the queen cells only from those capped uh, larvae, the, the capped queen cells, but leave the non-capped queen cells alone, then those should, you should be destroying these uh, and not bees. And so that way you're actually helping the bees do that selection where you're selecting for the higher quality queens and not the lower ones. So that, um, that's, that's a, a very interesting, um, an interesting point. It's something that uh, would be nice to see if, if you can help the bees in that selection process. But again, if you just leave, uh, um, leave it everything up to chance and that you're, you are kind of rolling the dice and sometimes the bees don't make the best decision. So there's a, a question here, a point here saying that somebody in their club um, keeps banked queens and nukes or queen castles. And he talks about uh, taking one frame from several colonies after the sourwood floor to start a new colony. Um, how high is the risk of losing the queen in such a situation? Well, this is in essence doing that same thing, right? So you're raising queens that have mated and started to lay eggs, but they're in queen castles or their banks, so they're not depleting their sperm supply, right? So you're kind of holding them um, in, in a, a, a state of limbo, right? And then uh, once, once the, uh, the sow would flow, um, comes or, or ends, making those splits and then placing those queens into those colonies so they start up right away, right? So that kind of gets to that, um, to that one figure about the longer it takes for the queens to start laying eggs, the longer it's going to take for that split to build up and to grow. So that's a way to, to bank queens or to put them in the queen castles and have them in reserve so that um, any splits that are made can uh, have a much better chance of taking off right away. So here's another question. In requeening using a swarm cell in a queenless colony, uh, does that carry the swarming instinct? So I, I think that makes a lot of logical sense. Uh, if that one way to raise queens is rather than doing it on purpose, <laughs> right, is that you go into a colony and you realize that they're about to swarm, 
you can excise those swarm cells out and then put those into your splits, and then you know they're going to raise perfectly good queens. Um, so the the idea then is that um, if you do that, you know these swarm cells then are going to be carrying the genetics from the original colony, which was trying to swarm. And so uh, while while that's true. Uh, I, I think that it's, it's a pretty low likelihood that you're going to be breeding some sort of super swarmy bees <laughs> unless you do it very regularly and in a very large population uh, and a closed mating population. The reason is is that swarming itself is, is a trait that is ubiquitous, right? All bees do it because that's their natural means of reproduction. And secondly, it's so intimately tied to environmental conditions. That is, nest congestion and other factors that uh, the bees are responding to. Now, yeah, th there are some bees are more swarmy than others, right? There are some uh, races and, and some, you know, tr uh, genotypes of bees that, that are more likely to swarm. Say the Ashkenazi bees, much more likely to swarm, right? So we know there is a genetic component, but for you to be able to select for that would take um, quite a bit because I think the heritability is pretty low. So it would take many generations and a very large um, population uh, to, to do that. So I don't think you're doing any harm necessarily in doing it, but it's certainly not helping, right? So I think it's certainly better um, rather than to, to take those swarm cells to rather take colonies before they're trying to swarm Take colonies with other traits that you like. They have lower mite levels. Um, they have uh, good brood patterns. They build up well. Um, you know those types of traits, and trying to foster those genetics um, rather than uh, being opportunistic with swarm cells. But I, I don't think you're um, you're you're polluting your your gene pool uh, by by using swarm cells in a pinch. So um, if there are no other questions, um, I think uh, it's been a good hour and a half discussion. I, again, I appreciate everybody uh, uh, attending. Again, one more thanks to the Montgomery County Beekeepers uh, for, for hosting this this evening. Um, and I really appreciate everybody's attendance. Again, the, the video link is going to be up on our website. and. Save the date for September and hope to see you all then. Thank you very much.